thank you again Thanks. for coming and the floor thank is you. yours. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. I know that the sun is out and there is plenty of things you could be doing right now rather than being here and listening to me. I appreciate that. Thanks for coming. I wonder if you have any idea what this lecture is going to be about. What do you think I'm going to talk about? What is it all? <coughs> Come on, give me your ideas. What do you think this lecture is about? One person. Don't be shy. Come on. Hey, you have like no clue, right? <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do is I'll try to explain to you what I'm doing. Um, the lecture is vaguely based on one chapter from my book. Um, this is my habilitation. It's 12 years of your life. If you want to go this way, strongly recommend it. Um, what I want to talk about today is the connection between how Americans make their foreign policy by using, cooperating, and exploiting partnerships with people who are not Americans, people who are from all over the world who share their political goals. This is basically what I'll talk about. Now, here is the agenda of the meeting. So you, what you can expect is that first I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you some theoretical background so you're not going to be completely lost, I promise. If you are completely lost, raise your hand and I'll try to address it and I'll try to explain it a little bit more. So first, what is public diplomacy? How does the state organize its foreign policy when we are not talking about bilateral intergovernmental relations? Okay. Then I'll describe to you what is psychological warfare. And you are already like, oh God, why am I here? This is going to be horrible. It's not, it's gonna be fun, you'll see. Um, then we'll talk about political warfare, which is a different concept. And the author, or the father of it, you're gonna tell me who he is. Um, and then we will enter the private factor. So when the government needs the private sector. What, what I mean by the private, I mean media, I mean business, I mean uh, charity foundations. I'm also meaning um, to describe to you people who share political goals with the Americans and need their help and they have something to offer. Then I'll give you an example of how this can work in practice. So I'll talk about freedom committees. And this is a typical early Cold War phenomenon that kept, uh, keeps on going. Um, it, it kept on going all the way till the 80s. And then I'll, I'll show you how it uh, transforms into um, today's situation. And then I'll give you a very precise example. And this is basically what this book uh, is an introduction to because I'm right now I'm working on the sequel which is actually this is like an introduction to a story of uh, partnership between East Central European exiles and American government for the sake of promoting liberation of our part of the world the East Central Europe so um, I think I'll be talking for about uh, 60 minutes if you're tired of if you don't understand or if you want me to repeat just raise your hand I I'm fine with it it does not uh, bother me if you stop me so the first thing I want to introduce to you and uh, explain before we move any further is to um, explain what do I mean, how do you understand public diplomacy? Because you all are very well familiar, if you're American Studies students, you know what diplomacy basically is. It's one government through its envoys, embassies, also intelligence agencies, is running its own foreign policy. Well, public diplomacy occurs when the foreign government talks to the society of a state. So for example, American government talking to the people of Poland. How do they do it? Well, they distribute magazines, they distribute radio programs, they distribute TV content. They try to steer the opinion of, a pe of peoples in any given country into the pro-American camp. Okay, this happens, of course, when there is freedom of speech, when you are actually allowing foreign content to come into a country. During the Cold War, this, of course, would have to be done uh, in a different way because this was not allowed. So how does American government work on public diplomacy? First, they need to know what people think about the United States. So they do run public opinion research queries, which, of course, oftentimes escape the traditional ways. You, you, you can't run a poll in Soviet Russia. You have to talk to people who escaped from Soviet Russia. You have to listen to their media. You have to do all sorts of policy research, right? Then um, you also need to know something about the country that you want to sway the opinion um, of. You prepare content, media content for distribution. It can be print media, it can be radio, it can be TV. Um, 
if possible, and even in the communist, in the Soviet dominated bloc, it was possible. We are now celebrating the 60th year of Fulbright here in this country. You open it up for exchanges, academic exchanges. People, you know, go both ways. Uh, people who work for government, academics, journalists, professionals, artists, they go cross the borders, and this way you are building a bridge of communications. And then, um, of course, there's another section of uh, public diplomacy where you have people uh, from the United States who go around the world and try to promote American culture. It can be jazz, it can be dance, it can be ballet, it can be anything. The mission is to get people around the world interested in all things American and supposedly, hopefully, like it and admire it for its achievements. Okay. Now, one thing that escapes public diplomacy, and oftentimes people forget about it, is that the American government um, is uh, prone, and um, one of the, its major problems is that every two years there's elections to the House of Representatives, and one third of the American Senate is being replaced. Every four years there's a presidential election. This is a democratic state. So if you want to run a cohesive foreign policy, you better explain it to your people. So what the State Department will do, and that's why I have the state here, it will also have a special office. It was called um, the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, and we have a whole office built around it, uh, which was responsible for projecting American policy upon the public and explaining why do we need to go into uh, Europe? Why do we have to go to Germany? Why do we have to... Um, confront the communists during the Cold War. So the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, the office was uh, inaugurated in 1944. In 1947, uh, the State Department changes again. In 1947, there's a special office. President Truman inaugurates um, policy planning staff. This is a, um, a very important place within the State Department because this is where policy gets formulated. This is where uh, prominent um, experts on different regions meet and project, uh, come up with the ideas of what American policy should be. Um, in July 1947, I really pray to God that you know that, um, CIA and National Security Council are created. Okay, I hope you have heard about both before, right? So um, it is important because it is the National Security Council that approves the proposal by the policy planning staff, and then the CIA implements it, okay? Now, in NSC, which is the National Security Council Directive, uh, number four, already issued in December uh, 1947, it was stated that psychological strategy was now the new way of dealing uh, with the new enemy that emerged after the end of the Second World War, namely, of course, the Soviet Union. And psychological strategy includes the uses of propaganda. Propaganda, which uh, can be of different colors, I will give you three colors today, white, gray, and black. I'll explain them in one second. For now, please remember that the Office of Public Affairs within the State Department deals with white propaganda mostly. Um, the CIA does the gray. Um, on the basis of the next document, which appears in June 1948, uh, which is already the 10th in the series of the National Security Council directives, the CIA also enters the black zone. And when you see the color, and when you get the fact uh, that I am intensifying the tensions, the Cold War tensions, 1948, uh, June is the time when we have the Berlin airlift. You know, Berlin is uh, blocked because of the introduction of the monetary reform. At, Hopefully someone in high school explained to you how important it was for the Americans to come up with the airlift, with the um, rescuing the people in West Berlin from the wrath of the um, communists. Have, has anyone heard about the Berlin airlift before? All right. Um, long story short, General Lucius Clay um, saved the Western sectors of Berlin by supplying the people who lived there through the air for over a year. Okay, so um, for a year, everything from coal to food, um, fuel um, was supplied by um, British, American, and French um, airplanes. CIA at that time is authorized to do more, not just gray propaganda, but also black propaganda. And this is the document that gives the CIA the right to operate 
as if it did not represent or act on behalf of the American government. This is the so-called plausible deniability. I cannot confirm, I cannot deny. I, I don't know, it wasn't me, it's not us. And you cannot you know, affiliate it with the American government because black propaganda means that um, the real source of information is concealed. It means that the content seemingly is created by the enemy. So it's putting lies out there in the, um, say, broadcast programs and attribute them to your enemy, okay? And this is basically disinformation. This is lies. So CIA is now authorized to do it, okay? In the war, uh, usually it's the army that uses it as one of the weapons of psychological warfare. This is nothing new. It does not come during the Second World War. It's, uh, you can go all the way back to, to antiquity trying to find the first uses of, of this sort of uh, use of psychological warfare among the different armies. It was used during the war by the OSS, Central Intelligence Group, and then the CIA uh, from June 1948 can um, also enter this area. What is propaganda? And uh, you know, today you might want to give me all sorts of dif uh, information, all sorts of definition. One thing you have to keep in mind is that we are not in the 21st century. I'm talking about late 1940s. And during the 1940s, you will find people to whom I will relate later who will tell you that uh, propaganda is information with a purpose. So you're trying to convince somebody. So some of you will say, oh, so it's basically a PR effort. Yes, it is, if we are talking about white propaganda. So this is what State Department does. This is what people do when they, for example, describe their experience, their experience during the war, their experience with the communist oppression. Then this is obvious. Who is talking to you and what they say is, is basically um, their own account. And normally, if we're talking about State Department, like you have here, or we're talking about Voice of America, American uh, Information Agency, USIA, we are talking about people who are um, representing the point of view of the government. And this is also um, to be considered propaganda. So a way information idea, doctrine, or special appeal um, are, are going to be projected upon a certain group in order to change their opinion, to inf and influence them favorably towards the sponsor. In this case, I'm talking about the government. There's also this gray zone. And this is where it gets really interested. interesting. Um, what, why I'm interested in gray is uh, this is where the government meets its partners. Because in the gray propaganda, um, the author is unknown. So we are repeating somebody's words without the clear attribution to the government, or we are using an, a, a person or a group who speak up their mind, and this gets projected, but they are friendly towards the government. So you are using someone in, in between, um, a liaison, a intermediary, uh, someone who is um, seemingly unaffiliated, but does speak in a way that supports the governmental agenda, okay? So uh, the, it's government friendly, it's to the governmental liking, but it's not the government that is talking, okay? So it's great. It might be that the government is sponsoring these people. This does not have to be lies, this can be all truth. But the purpose, going back to this one, this definition, is identical to what the government wants you to learn. Okay, so give you an example. The American government wants to, uh, the American people to believe communists are bad. And going up front and saying communists are bad, it's not gonna work. But if you have somebody come in here and tell you, well, I have seen communist elections firsthand. I know how they lie. I know how they terrorize people behind the Iron Curtain. And this is my story. Would you believe it? You would. But at the same time, the government is happy because you are now bought on the idea that communism is bad, right? So this is what I want to talk about today. The definition of psychological warfare is also in order because the whole concept starts with military. So during the war, a general wants to convince the enemy troops that something went badly wrong, that they should you know, stop fighting immediately. So oftentimes this is connected with lies. This is um, General McClure, who came up with this funny um, uh, definition of what is a psychological warfare. What he said was this is planned persuasion for the public purpose of weakening will to wield weapons, right? 
PW, this is how you find it in the, in the diplomatic correspondence. PW means psychological warfare. Basically, there are different areas where you can uh, try to persuade people not to fight. You can do it abroad through information, trying to build pro-American sentiment. You can do it uh, during the military operations, already during the war, as I said, or you can try to do the soft propaganda in order to prevent conflict. So you see there are different uses of the concept of psychological warfare, which is propaganda put to a governmental use, okay? So, now I'm going to try to explain to you how it worked in practice. Uh, we are in 1948, and we are going to meet uh, Mr. Cannon, George Cannon. How many of you have heard about him before? A father of American policy of containment? Mm -hmm. So, this is a document um, that changed the way Americans were thinking about dealing with communist domination in Europe. Um, the document that was titled Inauguration of Political Warfare was prepared by this man. This is extremely intelligent, extremely bright, well-trained, young diplomat who had gained influence by serving in a number of capitals in Europe. He's brilliant. His um, uncle was a great specialist in Tsarist Russia. He is, uh, in 1946, he's in Moscow. He's, um, work, he's fluent in, uh, in uh, Russian. He's translating for um, Ambassador Harriman. When Harriman goes back to Washington to tell President Truman, I really don't know what the Soviets are doing. They are not cooperating. We need a new policy. We need a new doctrine. You must have heard about Truman doctrine, right? So he's trying to change the mind of the president. In the meantime, George Cannon stays behind and he sends the so-called long telegram in which he explains why the Russians will never cooperate, why there is this inherent feeling of um, a complex or, or a feeling of fear from the outside world. They need buffer zones. They need to expand their empire in order to survive. They are thinking about uh, going um, against the capitalistic world, which they believe, as Stalin said early in 1946, will just um, eventually end up fighting another war because this is what capitalists do. They always fight wars. And the Soviet Union, of course, will live um, forever, but they want to stay away. Americans don't, uh, don't understand this. The Soviet Union just joined the United Nations. They are now rejecting to join the World Bank. They are not willing to join the International Monetary Fund. So they are puzzled. George Cannon comes up with the idea. He thinks the only way uh, to prevent a whole-scale conflict with the Soviet Union and in order to foster their collapse is to contain them, to stop them from expanding any further. And this policy is called containment, and this is going to get into the Truman's Doctrine in March 1947. But this is a textbook version of what George Kennan does. In fact, what he was responsible for was um, almost a parallel uh, project, in born in 1948, so one year after the president announced the Truman Doctrine, in which he proposed that Americans should not wait for Soviet Union to collapse. They should not just be content with limiting the expansion of the Soviet Union and the countries that they dominated. Kennan thought it's going to last five to ten years. Well, he was a little bit wrong. He thought there should be another program. There should be something that he called political warfare. He said, I don't want to mess up uh, with the people who are thinking about you know, how you control brains. This is the time when um, some uh, people in the military think that by uh, psychology they can um, weaken the will of the people to wield weapons, um, uh, to paraphrase McClure. Kennan thinks differently. That's why he calls it political warfare. He says the following. What we need to do is we need to reach out to the people who escaped from the Soviet yoke, from the Soviet wrath. We need to take care of the Cold War refugees and engage them so that they would be helping us to learn more about the Soviets and how they um, take on power, to um, give us info, to give us intelligence contact, and also to help us promote American mission around the world, telling the people that whatever we are doing, we are doing to save their freedoms, okay? 
He also thinks that American people, prominent Americans, should support them. So uh, by this, he, he means we have to form committees of prominent American citizens who will support the refugees, the exiles. He also thinks that money should be given to run covert information uh, operations in Europe, um, in Italy, in France. A lot of um, um, sums are being transmitted in order to help um, influence the electoral results to uh, fend off communist efforts um, to sway the voters in these two countries. There are also plans for paramilitary organizations, for paramilitary attacks. There is spying networks. All of these um, different areas of activities are supposed to weaken the Soviet bloc. Okay, so you see there's like two parallel tracks which are actually not really complementary. These are two different policy models. And as you can imagine, I am going to focus on the other one. So that is the political warfare, leaving this to the textbook um, version of things. If you would like to read more, if you, I think you should, uh, learn more about how American Cold War policies were shaped, you know, go and read Henry Kissinger. You know, his book on diplomacy is really readable and you will have all the different stages of how containment evolved lined out right there for you. <clears throat> Kennan, of course, as the head of the policy planning staff, um, Later, the author of the very influential article published in the Foreign Affairs uh, called Sources of Soviet Conduct was not the one who took on the job to carry out all of these complicated operations. This is a, the most important and most often neglected person who did a lot of um, plan and um, carried out a lot of operations behind the Iron Curtain. He's also the man whom we find um, as influential as it can only be when it comes to money and personnel in creating the Free Europe Committee. The Free Europe Committee, which will be my example, as you have seen on the first slide, uh, that I'll talk about in a second. Frank Wisner, a former officer of the Office of Strategic Services, uh, American intelligence units during the Second World War, a man who was in Romania, um, who was... Um, 1944, who was right there on the ground building spying networks, the man who was uh, helping people escape, the man who was also responsible for building an organization that I want to describe to you. The organization was called um, Office of Policy Coordination. If it doesn't mean a thing, if it doesn't sound like anything that you can um, connect it to, well, the chances are that this is connected to intelligence. And you're right. If it doesn't mean a thing, that means that this is a big thing. And this was. Office of Policy Coordination was created in September 1948. And this was an office that was responsive to what the State Department wanted, was paid by, by the CIA, but it was really independent from both, which means a lot of money, very little responsibility, and very... Um, enlightened and engaged leadership like Frank Wisner, who is free to do basically uh, many things that you know are hard to imagine. For example, parachuting paramilitary units to the countries behind the Iron Curtain, but also a lot of um, propaganda activities in Western Europe um, and in the United States. Uh, alone. So if you're thinking that this is something random, something not important, something probably she took out from one of the folders in one of the boxes in God knows which archive, this is a big thing. This is a, a page from the Foreign Relations of the United States. This is a series that contains um, an extremely well-prepared account of what American foreign policy looked like through every single administration. So if you are, whatever you're working on, whatever paper you want to write, what, whatever is your field, if this includes America's relations with the world, this is a place for you to look. Because you have historians who devoted their life, their entire careers, to putting these documents for you with footnotes, with explanation of every single abbreviation. It's a fantastic resource. Now, when you look the one on the establishment of intelligence, the establishment of American intelligence, um, volume, which was uh, released not so long ago, uh, maybe a decade, uh, you will find a memorandum um, exchanged between uh, Frank Wisner and the director of the CIA, which is, is abbreviated by, as, as DCI. 
uh, director of central intelligence. And you can see what the OPC was responsible for. So psychological warfare, poison pen, rumors, black propaganda at its worst, okay, trashing people uh, by the words that are spread uh, against them. Political warfare, which is the Kennan's vision, um, supporting resistance, uh, supporting DPs and refugees, um, encouraging defections. If people are escaping from Soviet Union, that is a great propaganda asset. That means they don't like it. So if they defect, if they abandon the system, that's actually really great for the propaganda use. There's economic warfare, which is completely against the United Nations um, Charter. That's a different story. There's support of guerrillas, sabotage, and the establishment of front organizations, organizations that are seemingly independent, but in fact, they do represent the interests of the American government. Are we home? Right? Okay, good. <clears throat> this is also where we find, for the first time, look, the date of this document is October 29th, 1948. There's no Free Europe Committee yet. There, nobody thinks about Radio Free Europe. And finally, I'm getting on the page when you are with me, okay? Th this is not known, this is not developed yet. And already here, Frank Wisner is saying that there is a plan for broadcasting to the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe from the US zone, occupation zone, in Germany. Empire project. Um, this is where it starts. The intellectual, but also financial, technical, and operational structures for what will become um, a major Cold War operation that was, I think, the most effective tool that the Americans developed during the Cold War. So I'm getting to the point. What is the state private network? You know, going back to my original question that I asked, like, what am I going to talk about? Well, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the connection between the American government and uh, its partners within the society that are ready to support it willingly because they share the goals or sometimes unknowingly, which was the case of, for example, student organizations. Students were really delighted that they were getting all these grants and funds for their organizations. What they didn't know, it was um, who underwrote the checks. Okay, It might have been the Rockefeller, <coughs> Carnegie, or um, Ford Foundation. Um, one of the Ford Foundation representatives once said that probably more than 80% of all of its grants went towards activities that supported anti-communists. Okay. What is happening here? What is the state private network? I'm going to use the definition by two experts on the matter, uh, Liam Kennedy and Scott Lucas, and they describe it as such. It's a broad, and they say in the context of the Cold War, unprecedented cooperation of officials um, American agencies with private groups or individuals. So it might be a uh, student union, it might be uh, trade unions, it might be the artist uh, organization, social clubs, it might be um, organizations established by the refugees, by the exiles, in developing and implementing political, cultural, economic programs in support of American foreign policy. So we have DOS's Department of State, CIA, OPC, now you know, of course, we are talking about Frank Wisner here. They are coming up with guidelines in terms of the Department of State and with the funding. They cannot, CIA cannot just go ahead and sponsor whoever they want, because this, of course, means that the American government is using these people, and everybody will call them agents of the American um, government immediately. So they are using the go-in-betweens. They are using the liaisons. And in this case, it can be a foundation, uh, say um, a journalist in France wants to go to a conference in Berlin and the Rockefeller Foundation is supporting his travel, which is great. Or for example, he wants to publish a book, but nobody, you know, the, the sales are not guaranteed. He's publishing 10,000 um, copies. Well, someone has just guaranteed that 9,500 are going to be purchased on the day the book is released. Great. What they don't know, what they don't understand is who is supporting this activity because the book helps to promote cultural agenda that American people want to see in France, okay? So this is the in-between. It can be overt, it doesn't have to be hidden. It can be overt, for example, the United States Information Agency will project the, the message that the American government, by funds, by the guidelines, wants it to share. FEC, it's Free Europe Committee. 
they are not some kind of a super spy organization. This is a legit organization, registered, working in the public. People know about it. Moreover, Free Europe Committee wants to be known. I'll explain this in a sec. <clears throat> what they do here is they absorb the guidelines, they absorb the funds, but then the messenger, the gray zone of um, transmitting the message that the American government wants to be heard goes to somebody else. It goes to either organization or an individual that projects, shares this message further on. So here it is, uh, Free Europe Committee, um, an organization that was established in 1949, an organization that, um, as its logo, used this Liberty Bell, and this is something you are definitely uh, familiar with, right? Um, we are in Philadelphia. This is the um, symbol and the sound of freedom that Americans want to project upon the world, and Free Europe Committee encompasses all the three areas because it is um, sponsored by the CIA all the way until the early 1970s. It does cooperate very closely with the Department of State and these symbols here are policy planning stuff where the policy is being developed by people like Canon. Then we have the public affairs and OAR means Office of uh, Intelligence and Research. This is the State Department's access to um, information. So. They're in constant cooperation uh, also because of the board members of the committee. And then because of the connection between the Free Europe Committee and private business, private media, um, and uh, foundations. I have uh, brought a list of the people who were on the board of the Free Europe Committee. And when you, when you read this, this is literally like who and who of America in the early 1950s. We have people here who are the editors of foreign affairs. We have people who have served on the Council of Foreign Relations. We have former military personnel. We have the um, uh, former OSS uh, um, officers. We have directors of banks. We have people who work in Hollywood, people who own uh, Time Life. Empire, we have diplomats, we have members of the government. This is a very powerful group, very influential. With these people comes esteem, contact, uh, prestige. They support, they endorse it because they believe there's nothing worse than further communist expansion, which brings havoc, which brings despair, which brings the collapse of independent sovereign states. So they are supporting it, but beware, all three elements are uh, equally almost important in the existence of the Free Europe Committee. So um, the Free Europe Committee has got two areas where it operates. One is in the United States where it tries to influence the people to believe it, that the American government is acting in the best interest of the American people when they fend off communist expansion, when they try to limit this evil empire even before Ronald Reagan comes into the stage. They are creating a special vehicle, a special tool to explain to the American people who is paying for it. Because how can you convince the American people to believe you if you tell them at the same time that you know, the CIA is paying for you know, the operations of the Free Europe Committee? They're not saying this. They are, the real uh, source of funds is covered by a campaign, a public um, campaign called the Crusade for Freedom, which is first the part of the committee, later it's a separate entity. Crusade for Freedom asks the American people to get involved. And I have a, a very, very short uh, video. Let me just play it. I hope you're gonna recognize the charming man who advertises your effort. My name is Ronald Reagan. Last year, the contributions of 16 million Americans to the Crusade for Freedom made possible the World Freedom Network, symbol of open freedom for the communist dominated people of Eastern Europe, and built this powerful 135,000 watt radio free Europe transmitter in Western Germany. This station daily pierces the Iron Curtain with the truth, answering the lies of the Kremlin and bringing a message of hope to millions trapped behind the Iron Curtain. Grateful letters from listeners smuggled past the secret police express thanks to Radio Free Europe for identifying communist quizlings and informers by name. The Crusade for Freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. 
Join now by sending your contributions to General Clay, Crusade for Freedom, Empire State Building, New York City. Or join your local community. This is a very prestigious address, right? Empire State Building, does it get any better when you think about Manhattan? Lucius Clay, the hero of Germany, the man who put together this extremely um, tedious effort to feed the people of West <laughs> Berlin. Well, this is big. And the actor is pretty handsome too, right? So this is getting um, into the minds of the American people. What we know now, it costs more money to collect this little um, fundraising effort donations. So going to the gasoline station and picking up the jar with coins, you know, collecting all these checks with $1, $2, $5 bills, it costs more to run it than it delivered. For an entire time, from 1949 all the way to 1972, Free Europe Committee was mostly underwritten by um, the CIA. So don't get carried away by the fact that the American people are supporting it. It's meant to, you know, if, if you are willing to give money to the cause you care for, that means you are engaged. And this was the purpose, okay? Oh. All right. But Free Europe Committee is not only about the radio. Again, the radio was the most important, the most influential, the most expensive, and the most amazing project that delivered true news to the people who were deprived, who were subjugated to censorship, limitation of travel, people who were not free. They could turn on the radio and listen to what was happening around the world, including their own country at times. Uh, the radio program was um, broadcast in national languages, so you had the Polish section and the Polish people could listen to the Polish radio, which was um, transmitted from um, uh, Germany, uh, Munich. But radio was not the only project, and this is what I wanted to share with you. Free Europe Committee was all about uh, integrating different sorts of activities that were meant to uh, steer the American people, but also the global opinion, also in the so-called non-engaged parts of the world, into the pro-American vision of how to um, build a, a front that will be basically a promoting Pax Americana. So we have, I told you, the PR campaign, which was the Crusade for Freedom. We have Speakers Bureau, when you can hire a person who escaped from the um, East and uh, tell you what happens. And um, you, you have um, a special unit where you care for the refugees who are still in the DP camps, people who are still unemployed, people who cannot find a place to live if they don't want to go back to the communist dominated country. You have Publishing House. There's a wonderful book about smuggling books through the um, Iron Curtains. It's called Hot Books in the Cold War. Alfred Reich is the, is the, is the author. There's a special research uh, center in New York. There's a university for people who couldn't um, finish their studies because of the war, and later they couldn't go back home. So the, this is run in connection with the university um, in Strasbourg. But then, this is what I am doing. This is my research. This is what I, what I write about. Then there are nine East Central European nations um, from the Baltic states, incorporation of which into the Soviet Union, Americans never recognized. So, you know, the Soviets took over the Baltic states in 1940 and then again in 1944, and they made them part of the Soviet Union as republics. Americans did not recognize it. So they still consider them independent countries. They're still supporting their diplomatic representatives who are in the West. So we have three Baltic states. We've got Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and then Albania, exiles, political exiles, former prime ministers, members of uh, um, governments, uh, members of the um, parliamentary bodies, uh, members of the Polish same um, journalists, lawyers who escaped to the West are joining the effort and create national committees or councils, depending on which nation we are talking about. And um, these are political bodies that represent the truly uh, legitimate leaders from East Central Europe, people who were elected either before the war or in the first elections right after the war, say in Hungary in 1945, where this was the last free election in this country. And um, they are taken on by the Americans and given support at the time when nobody else cares. The British, 
The British want to see us go. And even if this is our best and brightest soldiers that they have, they want to see the Poles go. The French, the Germans, the Italians, nobody, nobody cares. This is, you know, war destroyed Europe. Americans care. And the people want support because without it, they have nothing. They don't have money. They don't have influence. They have um, only friends who are left behind the iron um, right wire. These people came together and they formed an organization, the political exits from all over uh, East Central Europe. This was called the Assembly of Captive European Nations. And they worked together as a very efficient lobby. So they went around the world. They went also to the UN, to the Council of Europe. They went to the members of the government in Europe. And they said what happened and what was their agenda. Never let the West admit that this is a status quo, that the Soviets will stay in East Central Europe forever. This was their mission. We want free elections in our homelands, and we want the Soviets to take their soldiers and leave. And well, it's easy to say, it's very difficult to deliver, but for four decades, these people will go around, um, again, a number of continents around the world, trying to make sure that the world does not agree to Soviet domination of East Central Europe. Now, I want to go back to American policy. Why in the world would they choose to support these people? After all, they are deeply divided. I have a, um, a quote here from the chief of the international organizations divisions from the CIA. His name was Tom Braden. And he says the follows. Uh, the following. We had a problem with the refugees. It got to be just horrendous. They were eating up everybody's time. They were high-level people like prime ministers, and they were accustomed to talking only at the top. There was nothing we could do for them except to keep them busy and find a way to pay them. They were dead broke. There had to be some way of feeding them and keeping them in a blue suit. I always thought that it was it, that this was what Free Europe was all about. We had an interest in intelligence and also in caterers to go back, but after a while, the intelligence they were giving us was all gossip. They gossiped among themselves, and then they came and bored Ellen Dulles for two hours with it. Well, when you think about the number of people who are coming, and they're all complaining about Yalta, they're all complaining about the Roosevelt Democrats, they're upset. They will agitate the ethnic groups. You know, if there are six million Polish Americans, you know, all of these people will cause you trouble. They're a liability. Their arrival to the United States might be a problem to the government, okay? They might uh, be a security threat, too. What if they are working for the communists? We didn't know that. We have to register them. And they want to advance the agenda that's not ours. It's for Poland, it's for Czechoslovakia, it's for Hungary. Um, Americans have already recognized all of the governments in East Central Europe. They broke relations with Albania, but this is irrelevant. The Soviet Union is going to be so upset in the United Nations. This is a bad idea. Don't support these people. Why? They are only a problem. Also. You can't recognize them as governments in exile because you have already recognized the governments behind the Iron Curtain. And you want to keep that recognition because you want to keep your embassies open. Because that's a great listening point. On the other hand, they are also assets. They are bringing something with them. They have intelligence. They have knowledge. They have um, their own experience. They offer... Um, the chance of maintaining the scent behind the Iron Curtain by giving the people who are captive hope because they're cooperating with Americans. So somebody cares. There's someone outside in the world that does give a damn about whether the communists are going to persecute it, another group of people, say in Poland or not. So finally, these people are great asset when it comes to legitimizing American action. If Americans are going to get globally involved, well, they better have a good reason to do that. Well, these people, they want freedom for their homelands, which were taken over. So this legitimizes the American agenda of confronting the communists. After all, there's no Soviet tanks in Washington, but, uh, you know, they are all around um, East Central Europe. Um, for the future, if communism collapses, these people, if they ever go back, they'll be fantastic members of the new governments there. Uh, if not governments, then political structures. You know, reinstating the traditional parties, 
probably very pro-American, which is a good thing for American po from American point of view. The young people will be preserved, they will be educated, the, natural, the national culture will be preserved. So if Europe, and this is the American plan, I think CIA's um, largest expenditure in, the, in its first decades of operation was to promote European integration. Not really to confront the Soviets, but to promote integration of Europe. In American plans, this was always a plan for an entire continent, including East Central Europe. So if you want to see Europe whole and free, including the East, well, you better have a campaign to promote it and keep it up throughout the decades when everybody thinks the West uh, has won and the, the East is to be forgotten. If you want a public campaign, you need the money. And if this is the American government, governmental wish, you need clandestine support. And this is exactly what American um, government uh, does. It underwrites the project like Free Europe Committee. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip that because I don't want to bore you to death. Um, this is um, a slide that will help me explain why would the exiles decide to join the Americans, to enter in this partnership. This is how I define it. What's in it for the, for the refugees? First, if you have escaped from your homeland, fearing, fe fearing for your life, abroad, you seek security. And you really, very, there, there were only few cases where people had any access to any money, any sources to continue with public uh, political operations. So uh, your social prestige, if you are a former prime minister, and suddenly the only thing that you own is the coat you're wearing, well, you are pretty miserable. So if someone offers support, that's good because you can keep on going. You don't have to find a job as a janitor or maybe this will pay your family bill, but you get a means to continue your political operations. Second, if, if Americans are the only power that really wants to support them for the excess, for the refugees, this means that they get to preserve and protect their original national culture. They can publish journals in their native language. They can write their histories of what happened before the communists start publishing their own versions filled with lies. They can have impact on their homeland because now they have the microphones, because they can you know, smuggle the books that they published in the West. They can uh, deliver the hope to their compatriots saying, hey, we are here and we care for you. We will fight for you. This is important. After all, remember, these people are in exile because they were fighters, because they cared about freedom, okay? And finally, American support for these guys means that they have leverage, they have power. They can form a lobby, as I have shown you before. They can maintain the traditional political structures abroad. Even if this government of the United States is supporting them, that's even better, right? Because at the time when nobody cares for you, if American government is underwriting our operations, that means that they are with us, that they are supporting us against the greater enemy, which is the Soviet Union. If this is underwritten by the CIA, that's even better. Because that means that Americans are really serious and that they do care about our agenda, which is similar. All that they want, I mean the political exiles, is the same what Americans want get rid of communism from East Central Europe. Now, of course, as we go through the Cold War, things start to change. So the differences start to appear. There's different attitudes. For example, Nikita Khrushchev comes to New York. Well, this is something really hard to stomach for the exiles. So they plan to welcome him with a poster. They rented a garage opposite from the UN where they displayed humongous banners. And they have one poster. Uh, depicting Khrushchev, who is carried in electrical in the sedan chair by nine captive nations, and he says, "I feel closely bound um, to the colonial people." Right? And uh, the exiles said, "Well, East Central Europe was basically being colonized by the Soviet Union, so they put it up." But you know, again, they are also underwritten by the American government, namely by the CIA. So what happens when it contradicts American interests? Well, in the morning that Khrushchev comes to the United Nations in the 1960s, well, the poster gets covered. So there is conflict, right? But it also allows me to tell you that both sides maintain their integrity. So Americans, they have their own interests. And whatever they are doing in the world, it's to benefit the United States, not anybody else. But the exiles, they hold on their ground. And they're not giving in. They're not... Um, 
realizing American mission. All, all that they do is enter a partnership. And when there's a conflict, well, it shows. Now, the CIA is prohibited by its statutes from operating within the United States. And interestingly enough, uh, we have a number of pieces of evidence to indicate that it does. And uh, in uh, many ways, I'm not going to talk about all of them, in many ways, um, this has happened through the, again, um, some sort of organizations placed in between the recipient and the sponsor. In the case of the East Central European exiles, who are used as an example uh, by me today, this is the organization that helped them to project their own opinions towards American um, public opinion, Americans at large. So here we have uh, East Central European exiles sponsored by the Free Europe Committee and being prohibited from influencing the domestic politics of the United States. After all, they were working towards liberation of East Central Europe, not American people, right? But there's an organization that comes in, it's called the American Friends of Captive Nations. Um, and this is the outline of the purpose of this organization. Because the members of the ACEN are not American citizens, and because ACEN cannot carry on uh, educational work among the American people, much of their fine material and information goes to waste. The Crusade for Freedom and Radio Free Europe have rendered great service in encouraging the spreading of the message of these leaders behind the Iron Curtain, but Radio Free Europe is prevented by its charter from engaging in educational political activity in this country, which is the United States. We, therefore, have decided to form an organization to be called the American Friends of Captive Nations. We will not compete or duplicate the work of the nationality groups or other anti-communist organizations, but we will help them to be more effective in this vital liberation issue by providing leadership and centralized information. Now, this is the document I'm showing you. This is August 19th, 1964. This is an appeal, which identical appeal, that was, was sent to the both parties. You know, 1964 is the electoral year, 1963, President Kennedy was murdered. We have election, and both of the American parties, um, then this is the, the, the copy of the um, document sent to the Democratic uh, Party platform, indicating what do the East Central European exiles want? How should American foreign policy look like? This is pretty major if it gets discussed. And the people who are promoting this agenda, which was supplied by the East Central European exiles, are members of Congress. Uh, Thomas G. Dodd. Um, um, we have Edna Kelly, Kenneth Keating, uh, Tadeusz Machrowicz, Alvin Okoński. We have people of media. We have uh, Claire Boothluz. We have people who work in uh, the trade unions. Um, we have Leo Czerne of um, International Rescue Committee before. So we, what we have here, it's really the um, American establishment from all walks of life, again, which is supporting the agenda of this group of people who are supposedly not influencing American domestic policies. The most fascinating part of this story is this man who is the chairman of the um, American Friends of Captive Nations. And Christopher Emmett uh, is introduced usually as a uh, commentator on the radio and the chairman of the American Friends of Captive Nations. And let me just tell you a little bit um, about him. I'm going to maybe let me tell you who attended his birthday party celebrating his lifelong career. Probably you have never heard about the man. And the people who, uh, you know, not only uh, sponsored but also attended the dinner were, for example, Henry Kissinger, Paul Douglas, uh, Jacob Davidis, um, Maxwell Tyler, the former chief of staff, people who are America's elite when it comes to politics and business. And Christopher Emmett is the... Um, Men who is always somehow disappearing from the narrative, but then when you look at the organization as follows, 
And you find him, for example, a chairman of the Committee to Aid Britain by uh, Reciprocal Trade, Vice President of France Forever, Member Executive Committee of the Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies, Committee Against Max Expulsions for a Fair Trial of Draja Mihailovic for Freedom House, Common Cause, American Council in Germany, American Friends of Vietnam. And I keep on going, going, going. I have a whole long list here. He's in all of them. And this is not an accident that this person is in charge of working with the East Central European Exiles. Again, you see that somehow this operation needs to be steered in the direction that matches American interests. Now, I have talked about Free Europe Committee for a great deal of time. But I want to tell you that this example is not uh, the only one. This is the method that Americans used other than the big foundations, other than the social clubs and organizations, individual support, there were more free, com free committees, committees for free, for example, Asia. This was the short-lived um, endeavor that later it, it changed. Um, it also used the symbol of um, Liberty Bell. This, this one is matching um, the Asiatic con context. You have the Liberty Bell used by the Free Europe Committee um, displayed on stamps, you have you know the a logo of Radio Free Europe also featured the bell. But then we go on and there is a um, you know committee for free Cuba, we have Radio Free Afghanistan, we've got the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, we had Free Syria Committee and Free Syria Political Action Committee. This is not something irrelevant. This whole talk today, the fact that I'm you know telling you this stuff, it's not a bygone. It's something that matters. This is the way you can also do um, politics. Now, Americans in 1959 inaugurated, American president proclaimed on the, um, upon the request of the American Congress, the so-called Captive Nations Week, which said, we care for the people who are not free. We shall not uh, forget them. We will strive uh, to fight for the freedom of um, the captive nations around the world. And this included a number of people that the number of peoples that were dominated by the Soviet Union, not only states but also um, groups of um, national groups um, all around um, uh, Europe and Asia mostly. Now this is interesting. Because once proclaimed in 1959 by President Eisenhower, it was barely proclaimed again the following year in July 1960, and then barely in 61, and then in 62, and 63, and 64, and 65, and 66, and 67. And guess what? 2019, we're going to have it again. It was 2018, 2017, 2016. Every single president, every single year, proclaimed Captive Nations Week. As far as I'm concerned, communism is, has collapsed. As far as I'm concerned, the mission to liberate the countries of East Central Europe has been accomplished. And yet, every single president, President Trump included, has proclaimed the Captive Nations Week every single year. And now, I really found an interesting theory in, in this book. This is John Fusek to lead the free world, in which he combines three things that provided for American global engagement. He thinks that American um, feeling of national greatness, you know, American exceptionalism, you, you can define it uh, yourself, the feeling of global responsibility as the sole free power standing capable of defending freedom around the world, plus, in the Cold War context, anti-communism, later the idea of liberating, freeing people, together would create a construct that provides for American nationalist globalism. So their involvement around the world being explained. Okay. And so the mission continues. Um, to close the story of the um, Free Europe Committee and its uh, different projects, I want to tell you that in 1972, Board for International Broadcasting was established. It's no longer a super secret uh, thing who sponsors Radio Free Europe. Now it's the American Congress, the American taxpayers. They know what they pay for. They are not shy. And the Radio Free Europe is still in action, still in operation. So if you want to listen and learn more about the world east and south of us, tune in. They have really great podcasts, really great website. 
uh, by the way. Thank you. I will really entertain the questions. <laughs>